Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Blue versus Green Hydrogen, How to Decide. This webinar is presented by Strategic Decisions Group. And now I'd like to introduce today's first speaker. Dr. Sang Wan Kim is a partner with Strategic Decisions Group and head of the Global Energy Practice. Sang Wan, you have the floor. Thank you, Trudy. I also want to extend my own welcome to all of you joining us online today. I would like to introduce my co-speakers uh, who are joining us today. Mr. Einar Svensson, he is a principal with Strategic Decisions Group. He regularly leads energy transition strategy engagement for his clients as part of our energy practice. Also joining me is Mr. Jacob Simunovic. He is a principal with SDG. He regularly advises his clients with respect to clean energy investment decisions. Welcome, gentlemen, to today's webinar. Thanks, Langwan. Great to be here. Thank you. I want you to know that this is our sixth webinar in our Energy Transition webinar series. You may recall that we have uh, presented a webinar on hydrogen scenario planning um, previously, and we've decided to uh, present another webinar on hydrogen investment decisions from a decision maker's point of view, as there is a significant level of interest and activities in the space of hydrogen. Today's webinar will be composed of three parts. I will start off by giving you a broad overview of the hydrogen space with some example activities in the United States. You can think of this as a state of the hydrogen, if you will, with a focus on the US. And I'll pass it on to Anar. He will help us think about how to look at this hydrogen as a decision problem and flesh out what are the type of decisions that you need to make and the uncertainties that may not be uncontrollable, but still have a significant impact on your investment decision. He will also present us what are the factors that will drive the cost reduction of green hydrogen over time. Thirdly, um, Jacob will present the result of our analysis, meaning the cost, levelized cost of production of hydrogen between blue using natural gas combined with CCUS versus green hydrogen using electroly electrolysis um, technology. He will also help us understand how the regulatory incentives that exist in the US, such as Inflation Reduction Act, affect such economics between the two sources of producing hydrogen. As we begin, we want to get to know you a little bit. So please answer this poll. You may be involved in developing hydrogen technologies, um, such as uh, the latest technology in electrolyzers or finding ways to compress the hydrogen better to enable the transport. Or perhaps you are considering investing in hydrogen related business, uh, such as purchasing a large amount of hydrogen um, or uh, investing in production projects somewhere in the world. Or perhaps you're interested in broader hydrogen economy or your uh, interest perhaps in broader energy transition and you are curious about the hydrogen on the topic today. So please make your selection and click submit. Um, as we wait for the polls uh, to close, I uh, want to remind you uh, that please feel free to submit questions through the questions pane. We will try to monitor, answer them as many as we can, many of them as we can throughout the webinar today. I noticed that there were a lot of questions and topics that you have submitted as you registered for this webinar. I believe we will be able to address many of those um, topics and questions throughout the webinar today, and we'll do the best we can to address those during the webinar. All right, um, Trudy, I think we are ready to close the poll. Thank you. Okay, good. It looks like you're uh, mostly interested in broader um, energy transition, but a fair amount of you actually are uh, involved in hydrogen value chain. That's great to hear. Welcome again. Let's move on. Okay. Oops. All right. For those of you who have been um, attending our webinar series, you may be familiar with this graphic. What I want to remind you is that you want to understand energy transition as an ecosystem or evolution of the ecosystem of these five different players. 
at the very basic level, there is a transaction between energy producers and consumers. So whether as an individual, we want to charge our iPhone, um, or as a large ammonia producer, they need a large amount of natural gas to make their products, there is a consumer who needs certain kinds and amount of energy, and energy producers are in the business of providing or meeting their needs. There's an important role that policymakers or governments play because of the fact that energy is such an integrated part of our individual daily activities or industrial production. So they may regulate emissions from the industry or they may provide incentives to, for energy producers invest in lowering the carbon emission of their products. We need technology solutions to help us continue to lower emissions um, in energy producers producing lower carbon um, products to provide to customers to make them more affordable and accessible. We may disagree on the pace or even need of um, low carbon world into the future, but I think we can all agree that it would take a near enormous amount of investment to get even close to a net zero future um, in by 2050. So there is a large role for financiers play to play whether it is them investing in early stage technologies um, or investing directly in low carbon projects in the early stage. So that's the ecosystem of energy transition and how these different um, players make their decisions and how the interplay uh, would evolve over time will determine the pace and the outcome of energy transition. And I would make an argument that hydrogen economy evolution is such a great example of this framework. There are almost 50 countries in the world uh, that have established some level of hydrogen, national level hydrogen policies, given that it requires enormous amount of infra infrastructure that need to be developed and to address the gap between the current cost level and where it needs to get to. Energy producers need the confidence uh, to be able to FID their projects with commitment from the consumers who are willing to adopt the low carbon hydrogen in the early stage of the market. We still have a long way to go for the technology providers to continue to reduce cost of electrolyzers and other related technologies to make hydrogen more economic and affordable to produce. And finally, we need financiers continue to provide the funding to make the uh, evolution of the hydrogen economy happen. Now let's get to the specifics of hydrogen. These are the charts from international um, energy agencies, seminal report on net zero by 2050, where they laid out what it would take to achieve that net zero goal by 2050. What you see on the left is a set of um, amount of emissions in gigatons and how much is being emitted on an annual level and what are the set of activities that would be needed to offset uh, or store of those emissions once they're emitted. So by various different colors, you would uh, um, see those usual suspects. So we would want to electrify uh, many of those energy sources. We want to use for renewables and wind and, uh, wind and solar. We want to be more efficient in our energy usage. And of course, we need a lot of CCS projects to make that happen. What you see is uh, the dark blue color highlighted in red um, dotted area is the role that hydrogen plays. So that's the amount of the uh, reduction that we're counting on hydrogen um, to be accounted for. So you can say uh, we can agree that uh, it is not a uh, the major part of the reduction of the carbons um, out there, but it's one of the necessary drivers in reaching the net zero future. And how does it contribute is described on the right hand side. So on the right hand side, there are two charts. One on the left shows their projection of overall hydrogen production over, uh, the, over the last next 30 years. And right now, it's about 90 million tons, mostly gray, carbon intensive. But by 2050, they're projecting it has to basically quintuple uh, for five times, about 500 million tons, most of them produced in low carbon way in either through electrolysis or with, uh, uh, with natural gas combined with CCUS. Well, where's this hydrocarbon, uh, where's this new source of the uh, hydrogen uh, be used? So that answer is on the right. 
So the place where hydrogen would be most useful and critical in contributing to the decarbonized future is those hard to electrify and heat intensive areas. So that's in the area of refining, that's in the area of iron and steel making and certain chemical productions and also select areas in the transport um, such as shipping and, and fuel cell driven vehicles. So even in those sectors, hydrogen may not be the large dominant source of energy, but however, given the need uh, to electrify, given the need to decarbonize those areas and the fact that those are hard to electrify, that is the role for hydrogen to play. When I talk about hydrogen, I get asked by, uh, by folks in this question, well, if the uh, green hydrogen is going to become a reality, then we would need a very, very cheap source of renewable power. Well, if we have such cheap source of renewable power, why don't we just use that and electrify everything rather than going through the trouble of making hydrogen? There is certainly some validity to that claim, but there are areas that are hard to electrify, um, such as the areas that I have just mentioned in industrial usage and select transport areas. And that's the opportunity for hydrogen um, to play in. Uh, we will talk a little bit about the state of activities um, in the U.S. Um, so you're looking at a map of the activities uh, that were represented by DOTS, either early stage projects or any kind of the hydrogen applications that are happening in the United States. So this is a from a source called Hydrogen Forum. This is a publicly available source. So they have collected all of the announcements or project or application activities that are happening in the United States and categorize them into three different um, buckets, research, deployment, and opportunity, where deployment category appears to be the most uh, mature one with the uh, project operators and partners and locations identified. What we have found is that all 50 states have been represented in that list more than, with more than 340 applications or projects being mentioned. Some of you may know that US Department of Energy has announced a $7 billion grant program last year to support the development of hydrogen hubs, up to 10 of them in the United States. The first round of application um, have, uh, the, uh, have received about uh, the 79 applicants, almost 80, represent all 50 states. And the, when they tallied up implied capital spending from the application, it was more than $200 billion. Of course, we expect that, uh, we suspect that not all of the $200 billion project will go forward, but there's enormous level of interest, certainly. And the third bullet is based on the, um, the research from Aurora Energy uh, folks. Um, the, Europe will no longer be the major source of electrolyzer capacity, installed capacity by 2025, in large part led by fierce activities in North America. I, some of you may agree with me uh, that that was probably something that was unthinkable just a couple of years ago, where in the United States, hydrogen project was considered mostly a, a uh, energy intensive afterthought for quite some time. Things have certainly changed in the US. Uh, we're showing uh, select um, up activities in the United States. This is certainly not all of them. I believe after the first round of about 80 applications, uh, second round of applications were much fewer, um, but uh, in, the, in a few dozens. But just wanted to give you some examples of hydrogen hub uh, developments in the US. You see the one down in Houston, um, Texas area where I, where I live in, high velocity hub. That is actually responsible, that area is responsible for the majority of the current hydrogen production, which is mostly gray but it has the benefit of having the existing infrastructure and in pipelines and storage tanks and, and so forth. And naturally producers and localities have banded together and submitted an application um, to get the funding from the US DOE um, to build a hub in that area. Another is of course, California has to be represented. Um, it's high build Los Angeles. There, uh, there's a plan to build the uh, hydrogen hub using the green hydrogen. But then there are other places as well. Um, you see the hybrid project over in the Northeast area. It's basically a project um, to blend hydrogen, green hydrogen into the natural gas pipeline 
so that it can be used for residential heating. And this is led by National Grid utility company. And again, over on the left um, is Advanced Clean Energy Storage Hub is based in Utah, where they are trying to leverage the, uh, the largest salt cavern structure and use that as uh, for a major storage um, for hydrogen, just as we, we would build a natural gas storage. So activities are certainly happening um, in the US. So one more slide on the activities in the United States. Another publicly available source of US-based, um, actually worldwide, low carbon hydrogen projects is IEA, a hydrogen projects database. So we trimmed the list just to the, those projects that are located in the US. And we took out those projects that have been either decommissioned or in the demonstration project stage. And we found there were 92 such projects. One limitation with this data set is that they update only once a year. So it was a picture as of October of 2022. But I wouldn't be surprised if this number has to increase dramatically when this gets updated later in the year. But we get some interesting statistics from here um, where it, um, actually the green um, is about two thirds of the activities that are taking place in the US. And not surprisingly, most of the projects are under development as opposed to being operational. For those of you following the green space um, would be interested in the choice of electrolyzer um, technology for the green. All the data was um, incomplete, certainly. For those projects, the IEA was identi would identify the electrolyzer type. The membrane-based technology seems to be the, uh, the most popular choice compared to the alkaline, which is certainly more incumbent, more affordable technology at the moment. So that's something you can take away. And then I think it's really the last uh, chart that shows the versatility and abundance of and opportunities with hydrogen. So the three major sources, uh, three major use, current uses for the hydrogen seems to be uh, production of ammonia, uh, basically use uh, produce clean ammonia um, so that it reduce, dramatically reduces the, the carbon intensity of ammonia production, which may actually help create new market for ammonia, such as shipping and uh, electricity production, or use it directly for electricity production, or use them for mobility um, applications, um, such as aviation or uh, the fuel cell um, trucks and vehicles. And with some other industrial uses that we have talked about, such as refining, industrial, and other sources. So this is the uh, the level of activities that we see happening, and we'll certainly follow how this develops over time. I think we are now ready to move on to the next section, where Einar will discuss how we want to think about the investment decision on hydrogen. Einar, please take it away. Thanks, Ingwan. Yeah, let's move on into how to think about decisions in this space. Uh, so obviously hydrogen projects and investments are quite a complex decisions with a bunch of issues to consider. So just to name a few, as they pop up here, sort of anything from the input price of, of gas or renewables, to how much is it going to cost overall, what financial incentives and regulations can it make use of, Who's going to buy the hydrogen? How profitable will it be? What's the level of uncertainty around that? All of these are questions that sort of pop up and the list just goes on and on. Uh, but as usually with decision making, we need to try to be sort of clear about what we're trying to do. We need to be clear on what are our decisions, uh, which are controllable, what are the uncertainties, which are uncontrollable, things that can impact our, our value and outcomes. And also, and last but not least, sort of what do we actually want out of this? Uh, but let's talk about a few of those. In the decision space, there are obvious things like where should we develop our, our hydrogen project, assuming we want to do one? What technology should we use for producing hydrogen? So this could be sort of green or, or blue hydrogen. So if it's green, what type of electrolyzer? If it's blue, sort of what are we going to do with the CO2? Uh, if you're doing green hydrogen, should you build dedicated renewable sources? Uh, that may be because it's the best option. It may be sort of demanded by regulations even. Uh, what market should you target for the hydrogen production and how to secure that? So today, I'd say it seems the most, or at least the most mature projects have already guaranteed their offtake. So they already have a partnership or agreement with someone who will use the hydrogen if they're not using that 
themselves. I think in the future, maybe we'll see more of a market here. Partnerships uh, also, I think most players in the hydrogen space are, are sort of very active in partnerships. This risk is just so large that it needs to be shared along the value chain one way or the other. Okay, so that's uh, some examples of what you can actually decide, but what are the uncertainties that uh, are around? Of course, so sort of depending on your technology, it's the price of the inputs into your process. So what you do in blue hydrogen, or what's the price of natural gas going to do in the future? And for green hydrogen, what's the price of the renewable power? And how will the two of those sort of uh, develop over time? Uh, you need to think about the investments that you're making. So for green hydrogen, it could be electrolyzers, the main capital cost. And for blue, it could be sort of the, the facilities and, and, of course, the carbon capture. And as with all investments, you need to think about cost escalation, uh, inflation, and so forth. And then, of course, operating cost. And last but not least, uh, uh, whatever incentives there are in place. So what kind of, uh, I guess in the U.S., can you make use of the 45Q and 45V credits? What are the local incentives? Uh, and also, as you may talk about, sort of are the green premiums to be considered and so forth. Uh, on the value metrics, uh, I think the traditional ones are usually sort of financial, sort of uh, what kind of NPV can you expect and uh, does the IRR, IRR meet your sort of uh, thresholds and so forth. But of course, there's other metrics that sort of anything from carbon reduction uh, sort of and also thinking about when projects will be online and so forth. So a lot of things that you want to measure and, and understand. Uh, okay, let's take one step ahead here. And, and sort of before we dive into the details and, and our views on some of this, uh, we'd like to ask you to participate in this poll. So which hydrogen production technology would you invest in in the US now if you were investing? Would you invest in blue hydrogen, so natural gas or carbon capture, green using renewables, uh, gray, brown, or black using coal and natural gas without any removal of CO2, or any other kind like pink, turquoise, or, or other? Please go ahead and, and select the one that uh, you think is most appropriate for your current views. Okay. Thank you, um, Aina. Why do we uh, wait for the polls? Um, mm -hmm. I, we talked a little bit about the level of activities uh, with respect to hydrogen that are happening in the United States. We certainly did not want to alienate um, any of our um, audience from joining from the other parts of the world, although they still may be interested in the activities in the U.S. From what yeah. you've seen out there, how do the activities in EU, uh, for example, compare to the, the activities in the U.S.? Uh, so, uh... As you said, I probably introduced. So I live in Europe and do most of my work there. And I see, I think the demand for hydrogen and sort of the hype in some sense started to a large extent in Europe. Uh, I think there's more sort of, of these net zero goals and, and needs to or sort of earlier declarations of those that have pushed for it. Uh, and we see, for example, I've attended conferences of hydrogen uh, that have doubled in size between last year and this year in Europe. So. There's a lot of appetite, but what I also heard and seen, sort of the IRA in the US came sort of out of nowhere somehow, and, and a lot of companies are shifting their investment focus in the US, at least in the in the near term, while the EU figures out what they're gonna do. They have less, sort of there's less clarity on the incentives there. They have the hydrogen bank, which is more like an auction system. So you're not guaranteed to get something out of that. Uh, so I'd say, yeah, Folk investment focus is a lot in the U.S. right now. I feel like the demand and offtake is still stronger in Europe and, and, and Asia. So maybe you'll end up uh, exporting quite a bit of what's being produced in the U.S. there. Yeah, I wouldn't be, wouldn't be surprised. I think we need a lot of offtakers for the hydrogen projects being planned in the U.S. to the rest yeah. of the world. All right. Thanks, Anar. Okay. And yeah, I assume we probably have, a, we can look at the results now. See how that played out. Okay, now this is uh, interesting. So quite even on on blue and green, and and a few sort of outliers in the other sort of gray brown and and other. Uh, I'd say that uh, yeah, maybe not surprising given our our sort of U.S. focus. I think 
if it was done in Europe and, and sort of especially last year, you see a more focus on green. There's some countries and some companies that are sort of have more of a green focus over blue. But I think this is quite representative for sort of what's what's happening with the investments as well. Okay. So very good. Okay, now that we've sort of explored your views on this, let's have a quick look into how we can think about the cost structure and cost of the different types of, of hydrogen and how they compare and how they may differ uh, going forward. Uh, as per the name of this uh, uh, webinar, Green versus Blue, we'll, we'll talk about those two. Uh, so let's start with, with blue hydrogen and, and sort of let's start here in the middle in the blue part. So a good way to compare the cost of different technologies of hydrogen because they may differ in sort of how much capital versus optics and so forth there will be is to calculate the levelized cost of, of the hydrogen. So that would be measured in, in dollars per kilogram of hydrogen. So pretty much the same idea and methodology as you use for a levelized cost of electricity. So you take the lifetime cost and, and sort of uh, uh, evaluate those uh, uh, with a discount rate and so forth and, and are able to come to this unit. But let's look at the, the components. Uh, if we start with levelized cost, obviously for blue hydrogen, you need to make some sort of capex investments in your hydrogen plant and processes. So I think that's straightforward. Uh, on the recurring costs or the operational costs, you can sort of a big component of that is going to be the input of gas. So what's the what's the cost of the gas going to be? Uh, that's going to be primarily driven by what happens with the sort of price of natural gas in the world or in your region, maybe. Uh, but also there's another consideration sort of depending on, on how you set up your processes and so forth, so forth what's the conversion efficiency from, from gas into to hydrogen. Uh, not uh, sort of to be forgotten, of course, if you're doing blue hydrogen, you need to both capture, transport and store the CO2. And this can actually be a, a large chunk of your overall costs here. Uh, there's other annual costs, sort of just running the plant, there's electricity and manpower and so forth. Uh, but here on the right, sort of we've talked about sort of there's a lot of incentives that can reduce your costs. You can think about those as revenues or cost offsets. But for example, in the US, you can get the 45Q tax credit uh, for the carbon that you store and that can offset the cost of, of your whole system here. So as with other things, there's a lot of uncertainty with respect to some of this natural gas price, of course. And I think with carbon capture, uh, sort of what the final cost of that is going to differ a lot between where you are, what technologies you use, and how the technology costs develop over time. Now, so that was blue hydrogen. Let's have a quick look at green. Uh, and again, let's start at the sort of levelized cost of hydrogen. So what drives it? On the capital front, uh, it's, uh, you know, of course, sort of have a sort of plant cost and so forth, but the sort of one of the biggest investments that you make there is going to be in the electrolyzers. Uh, so how much are the electrolyzers going to cost is one question, but how much sort of the size of your electrolyzers or the number of them is going to be also driven by the capacity factor of your plant. Sort of, are you able to run your electrolyzer plant 24 seven or do you need to run it only when your renewables are running? Uh, that may be demanded by regulations. And that's actually one of the, I'd say the biggest uncertainties with respect to green hydrogen production, both in the US and EU is how the government's regulations will determine if you uh, sort of if you need to build new renewables to do green hydrogen and to what extent they need to be matched on a sort of hourly or daily basis. So depending on the stringency of these regulations that can actually play a part here on, on how this looks. Uh, the two boxes here I'd say relate to sort of how is the cost of electrolyzers going to develop over time. And it's probably going to be driven by how sort of how much it's installed in the world and how much the learning rate or sort of how much the cost reduces. I think usually defined as every time you double the installed capacity. So that's going to drive your initial capital. But when we come into the recurring cost of the OPEX, uh, the thing here, the stack lifetime. So the stacks are the main components of the electrolyzers. 
those actually need to be replaced depending on technologies, depending on uses and so forth. This may be anywhere between five and 10 or five and seven years. So electrolyzer investment is not a one-time thing. You need to essentially buy a big component of the system again every few years. So the cost development over time is of consideration as much as uh, today's cost. Uh, the key input is electricity from renewable power. Uh, what's the cost of this renewable electricity going to be? Uh, and how efficient is your electrolyzer in, in sort of converting that electricity into, into hydrogen? There's other costs, both from sort of driven by power cost uh, for the other parts of the process and sort of manpower and so forth. And in the same manner, there are going to be some financial incentives, for example, in the US, 45 V tax credits, which under the right sort of conditions can get you up to $3 per kilogram of hydrogen. Uh, okay, so what are the key differentiators when we compare blue and green? I think the obvious ones, of course, are the key inputs, sort of natural gas versus renewable electricity. That's one. Uh, there's different incentives. In the US, it's maybe quite clear how they differ. In other areas, it's less clear and how that will develop. But another key feature is the different sort of, I'd say, new technologies or emerging and developing technologies. So for blue hydrogen, the cost of carbon capture and storage. And for green hydrogen, the electrolyzer cost. How is that going to develop? And we've chosen to dive a little bit deeper into electrolyzers as we've done some work in that space. So let me tell you. A little bit more about that. Uh, as we discussed before, uh, we expect the cost of electrolyzers to come down with time. And I think that's based on sort of just both common views and, and sort of several reputable sources here have uh, provided forecasts on, on how they expect the different uh, technologies of electrolyzers to develop over time in terms of dollars per kilowatt installed. Uh, you will see here that there are two technologies that are mapped out here, AE for alkaline uh, and PEM for sort of protein exchange membrane. I think as Sangwon mentioned before, alkaline is sort of the historical technology that we've been using for I think over 100 years. PEM is sort of more emerging uh, and I think the consensus today is that alkaline is probably cheaper. Uh, while PEM has some features that uh, may be beneficial in, in certain situations, you require less space for it. Uh, it sort of, uh, there's less maintenance to some extent. And I think another really important feature, however, is it's a younger technology. So at least there are people and, and sort of uh, companies that believe that there's more cost reduction going to happen in that space. Uh, and I should mention also that uh, there are other technologies out there uh, that are sort of coming into the mix. Uh, for example, solid oxide, uh, which is a technology that is sort of more efficient if you have access to cheap sources of heat or, or sort of a, a waste heat that you're not using. It operates at much higher temperatures, but at a higher electric, electrical efficiencies. And there's also uh, new technologies that are considered promising, anion exchange membranes, also some variations of these technologies here, sort of high pressure alkaline and so forth. So it's a, it's not too different from the sort of solar space or something maybe 10, 20 years ago and sort of what which technology will win, will they coexist, how quickly will the cost develop, all sort of to, to, deter, to be determined and to be potentially reflected in, in any kind of uh, investment decision. Uh, I want to conclude with just a few words on sort of why are we quite confident that cost reductions could uh, happen in this space. So it, it is a new space. Uh, I think uh, we expect sort of just to meet the appetite today that the sort of the total the global capacity of electrolyzer producers needs to increase five or tenfold before 2030. Uh, and so it's obviously sort of growing exponentially more or less. And when we look at other examples, which may be familiar to you uh, from the sort of relatively recent past, so the US shale revolution. So in a few years time from 2012 to 2016, uh, they saw almost a, like a, a, or over half 
sort of 50% decline in the cost to sort of drill these shale wells. And uh, just because I guess at the start of this period, the oil prices were high. There was a big incentive for trying to extract the oil and I guess and gas. And, and I think even this revolution here, at least by many is considered to be one of the big reasons why the oil price started to decline again, because it just became more efficient uh, in the market. So huge sort of decline over a short amount of time. Uh, EV manufacturing, so it's not a long time. I think it's only sort of in, in 2018, a Tesla Model 3 was, was the first time it was sort of priced below 100K. But today you can go onto a website and order one for around 40K. Uh, so over a few years, that's really reduced. And another maybe closer in, in sort of technology space is the solar and wind, both of which in a 10 year time frame reduced in sort of cost per kilowatt by sort of 70% for wind and 90% for solar. So just some examples of sort of supporting the views so, of, okay, electrolyzer costs will come down in time. Uh, and this is spe spe specifically important for electrolyzers, as we mentioned before, because it's not a one-time investment. You invest today in the first set of stacks, but in five or seven years, you need to replace them. So your views on how much the cost will decline and which technologies will decline faster than others could be an input into both. Do I go, do I go for green hydrogen or blue hydrogen? And if you go for green, what type of electrolyzers you choose? Okay, I'll leave it at that and transition over to you, Jacob, to tell us a little bit more about these costs. Thank you, Einar. So yeah, I'm going to pull it all together here and show you some projections on blue versus green uh, hydrogen production costs in the U.S. Oops, let's go back here. Okay, so uh, what you're looking at here is our projections for green versus blue hydrogen production costs in the U.S. without subsidies. And maybe to just help orient you with the graph, this is levelized cost of hydrogen, which ANR introduced just a few slides ago uh, over time. And you'll see pretty wide ranges for both the technologies. So green is obviously the, the green hydrogen, the blue range is, is the blue hydrogen range. So whenever we're tackling some of these long-term capital investment uh, uh, decisions, like a hydrogen uh, uh, production investment, we like to try our best to capture the uncertainty that's often baked into a lot of these investment decisions. So if I if I jump back to ANR's uh, evaluation structure slide here, there's a lot of uncertainty in these investments. So for example, on green hydrogen, you don't really know exactly what the capacity factor might be for the, the plant. And that might change over time, depending on how technology uh, and, and uh, the, the, the manufacturing scales up over time. On blue hydrogen, you don't know what your natural gas costs are gonna be over the lifetime of the facility. It's a very volatile uh, commodity that, that moves every day and every year. So there's a lot of uncertainty baked into these projections. And what we do is we put uncertainty or ranges on all of the inputs into our model, and that's how we're able to develop ranges on the final levelized cost of production that you see here on, on this slide. So the way to, to read these graphs are the thick line, so the thick green line or the thick blue line, those are the expected value uh, projections. So what that means is when we range all of those inputs in our model, we run a simulation with thousands of trials, and on average, these are what the results are showing. So in 2023, we're showing a levelized cost of blue hydrogen of about $2 a kilogram. For green hydrogen, it's about $4 a kilogram. But there's really a lot of uncertainty in this, and that's what you see in the ranges. So the dotted lines, so the dotted for the green, uh, the, the high and the low, those represent what we call the P10 or P90. So it's the 10th percentile or 90th uh, percentile estimate. So what we're really saying is that in these shaded regions, about 80% of our uh, estimates were falling in these shaded regions for each of the technologies. So for 
Uh, green hydrogen, that's somewhere around two and a half dollars to six dollars uh, in 2023. For blue hydrogen, that's about one dollar to, to three dollars a kilogram of, of hydrogen. So what's the general takeaway from this? Well, one is it appears that blue has quite the uh, cost advantage over green. If you just look at the expected values, uh, blue is uh, significantly lower than green. Although there are some scenarios, like if you hit these, uh, the, the, the P10 uh, area for green, uh, you can start to see some overlap with the, the blue estimate. But at least without subsidies, it looks like right now, blue has the advantage. Now, as Anar and, and Sangwan had mentioned, uh, we're not in a world uh, without subsidies, uh, especially in the US. The IRA has really been a, a game, game changer and, and changed the market in the last few years. And I don't wanna spend too much time on this, but just for folks that aren't uh, intimately involved in this sector, a few key things to, to point out is if you invest in blue hydrogen, you get the uh, 45Q uh, tax credit, and that's for every ton of CO2 that you capture and then inject into the ground, you get uh, essentially a payment from the government, so $85 per metric ton of, of CO2, which for a large hydrogen facility really, really adds up. For green hydrogen, you're likely in the 45V uh, tax credit uh, area, and the amount of subsidy you get from the government depends on the life cycle emissions of your facility. But for most uh, uh, green hydrogen facilities, you should be in this uh, lower region here, getting the, the highest uh, tax credit available, which is about $3 per kilogram of, of hydrogen. So the last slide I showed you was uh, based purely on economics. It showed you how the two technologies uh, uh, compete. Now, if we bring in these uh, subsidies, which are, are quite large, uh, here is how the, how the uh, uh, cost competition changes. So you'll notice that one, uh, blue or green starts to become uh, quite cost competitive uh, with, uh, sorry, green becomes quite cost competitive with blue. And you'll notice that by looking at the expected value lines here, the thick green and the thick blue, by 2030, we're actually projecting them to be almost uh, exactly the same. Uh, one thing you'll notice is that in the 2030s, this graph bumps up to look like the previous graph I showed you. And that's because of the expiration of the IRA. So it doesn't last forever. Uh, you have to get your facility in by a certain date, and then uh, assuming that the IRA is not extended, like what we've seen in terms of extensions for like, the, the solar ITC or, or, or the PTC for wind, if that doesn't get extended, then you're going to see the market revert back to, uh, uh, I, I'd say, something along the lines of more pure economics, and you'll see blue have a more sustained advantage relative to green. But at least in the current world we're living over the next decade, green and, and blue look very uh, cost competitive and there's a very wide overlap. So you'll notice that the, the green range, uh, it, it completely overlaps the, the blue range. So it really is going to depend on um, the uh, specific assumptions you make or the specific project you're looking at in terms of, of what, uh, what makes the most sense. So what, what really drives, for example, uh, you uh, potentially heading up to your high uh, green hydrogen cost range or your green low, low hydrogen uh, cost range? Well, that's where a tornado diagram becomes uh, really helpful. So I'm guessing a lot of the folks on the call here have, have seen uh, an output like this before. But for those of you who have not, what this does is it takes all of our inputs in our model, which are uncertain. I mentioned that we, we vary them in, in the simulation. And then it looks to understand which of those assumptions is most important for driving the ultimate end result that, that we care about here. And in this case, it's the uh, differential and the uh, levelized cost of, of hydrogen. So if you look at the, the middle line here, uh, going up to about zero, it's, it's almost zero. 
So what this is saying is that blue and green are, are essentially at cost parity in 2030. And that's just the, if we jump back to this graph, that's just the difference between the, the green and the blue line here in 2030. So they're about even. And what we want to understand is like what, what could cause you to be up in this world or what could cause you to be down uh, in this world. And uh, what we found is that your renewable price assumptions uh, and your gas price assumptions are the most important drivers for this decision. So if, for example, instead of having a $40 per megawatt hour uh, PPA to serve your electrolyzer at your green hydrogen plant, if, for example, you can get a $20 PPA, uh, then that's going to uh, really give green the cost advantage. If you're looking at a $70 per megawatt hour facility or you've got lots of uh, uh, transmission and distribution charges to try to get, get hooked up, uh, then uh, blue is going to have an advantage. Same thing on natural gas. If natural gas uh, uh, shoot, shoots way up and you're in the $10 range over the next uh, 20 years, it might be a little uh, aggressive, but if you were to hit the $10 range, then green's going to have an advantage. If they stay really low, as they are today, closer to the $2 range, then blue is going to be quite cost competitive. So it's really the, the feedstock or the OPEX that's uh, driving these decisions. Perhaps one, uh, one finding that was interesting for me as I was first getting involved in the space is that it wasn't the assumption on the electrolyzer capital and the learning rate that was the, uh, the most important. There's a lot of buzz in this sector about uh, green hydrogen capital costs and how fast will they come down. And of course, that's uncertain. No one knows. So we've ranged that using a, a learning rate. But what we found is that, well, it's an important assumption. It's not nearly as important as what your uh, gas or your renewable prices might be. So the specifics of your hydrogen strategy, are, it's really going to be uh, uh, project location driven, and that's going to uh, drive your, your choice of, of technology. Okay. So we're just showing you cost, levelized cost of hydrogen. Of course, when you're developing your hydrogen strategy or thinking about a blue versus a green, uh, investing cost is not everything. There's a lot of other considerations that we don't have time to, to get into in this webinar, but we just wanted to at least list a few of them based on what we've seen in the market. So of course, you got to think about production costs, but you also have to think about who am I going to sell this to? So who are our target customers? What industry and region should we focus on? Do you want to be focused on power generation in Asia? Do you want to be importing into to Europe? Do you want to focus on domestic US? So that there's a lot to, to think about in terms of uh, what region you target and what's your um, end user look like. You might want to be thinking about your commercial strategy. Uh, do you need to and do you want to secure a firm offtake agreement or do you want to be exposed to, to, to uh, uh, market volatility and market prices. Uh, is green hydrogen going to command a price premium over blue hydrogen? So maybe you get some value there with green that you won't get with blue. You might want to be thinking about regulations in your target market. So if you're importing into Europe, you might be exposed to the uh, carbon, uh, the CBAM, the carbon border adjustment mechanism or, or carbon tax there. You might want to be thinking long term. So IRAs, you know, next 10, 10 plus years, but uh, these investments take five years just to, to get potentially uh, up and running, and then you need 25 or 30 years to pay them off. So you might want to be thinking about how do subsidies and regulations develop in the U.S. long term, and you might, might also want to be thinking about partnerships and uh, what type of partner brings the most value. So that's a very quick uh, overview, but those are also critical factors when you're thinking about a, a green versus blue type investment. Okay, so uh, I'd like to uh, wrap up my section here with a poll, and it'd be great to hear from the audience on what do you see as the biggest challenges in terms of making hydrogen investment decisions? So is it because you don't have a clear objective in pursuing uh, hydrogen? Is it because it's hard to predict how the hydrogen economy will evolve? 
Is it because you don't see a way to make profits in, in that industry? It's just not profitable for you. Economics don't, don't make sense. Or is it because you have too many opportunities to evaluate and choose from? Or perhaps there's just internal disagreement. So you don't have the internal support to really pursue a hydrogen investment in a major way. Okay, and I see the votes slowly starting to come in. Shaka, we're we're uh, we're allowing two responses, right? Uh, the uh, audience can yeah, select oh, two. Uh, correct. Correct. Uh, yes. Uh, multiple choice. So while we wait for the results, um, you basically show the analysis of blue versus high, uh, the green hydrogen cost, and there's a, such a wide overlap uh, between the two. Um, it, can we understand that hydrogen? Uh, sorry, the the Toronto diagram analysis as a generic. Um, location in the U.S. or do you have some specific um, project location in mind for that analysis? No, it's very generic. So for, I mean, if we think about our top two risks, the uh, uh, renewable prices between 20 to 70 dollars uh, per megawatt hour, that's probably uh, indicative of uh, different regions throughout, throughout the, the U.S. and how they might trend over the next uh, 10 years. And then on, on gas, natural gas price, uh, same thing, no specific area uh, assumed. And even within a specific area, gas is quite volatile. So you could be in that two to ten dollar range in, in a given year. So it's it's generic, I guess, to answer your question. Right. Okay. So I think in, in some parts of the country, I believe like twenty dollar renewable price was not out of the norm. And of course, at the same time, the lower end of the gas price could also happen in some parts of the country, like Gulf Coast, for example. So, I yeah. guess to very location specific. So, 20 is like a little aggressive, but definitely like 25, 30, you can get that in the US. Um, okay, so I think the polls, uh, I think most folks have voted. So, Trude, I don't know if you want to cut off the poll. Okay, so. Here are the results. So I, maybe not surprising is most folks are concerned about how the hydrogen economy will evolve. So that's what we're also seeing. There's just like a ton of uncertainty in this sector. And it's a lot of capital that, that folks need to put up to get these facilities off the ground. So there's a lot of concern about uh, uh, all the uncertainty there. And then the, uh, the next, Biggest one is we don't see any way to make profits with hydrogen, which is interesting. Uh, I wouldn't have expected that, but I suppose a lot of folks are not seeing the, uh, the, the economics work there. And then we got about an even split between too many opportunities and not having clear objectives. Okay, so that's an interesting uh, poll there. Okay, so now I'm going to hand it to Sang Wan to wrap up here. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Jacob. So we started off by covering the state of the activities uh, with a focus on the U.S. and how the regulatory incentives like Inflation Reduction Act, the HUBS program are really supporting activities. Uh, but as you have a decision lens on um, the, uh, the making investment decisions on hydrogen projects, uh, while the the color is more of a label, but it actually has significance in terms of what technology you should use. And depending on which technology you use or which location pick or which market you, you target, you're actually facing some significantly different choices and you need to think through those um, carefully. We talked about how to neutralize your cost reduction over time may drive the, uh, uh, the changes in green hydrogen cost and the fact that the economics of Basically, I think that the conclusion is that there's no no one size fits at all, basically in terms of understanding these hydrogen projects. It's location specific, um, and and a lot of those the uh, project specific considerations need to be taken into account. I think we have a few minutes to address some of the questions, um, and I think I'm going to ask this both of you, Jacob and Anar. There were a lot of questions about the prices. Um, so we talked a lot about cost, but how much um, the, what is the price level for this hydrogen uh, with, uh, with low carbon? And is there a certain price premium that is being willing to be borne by the customer? Um, and also how we should think about these price premiums. So 
I'll uh, I'll ask Einar first. Get your thoughts, and then come back to Jacob. Einar. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I think in my work in Europe, we we definitely see uh, green premiums being a key consideration for hydrogen investments. So, just to name an example, um, in the shipping industry, I believe all the companies offer products where you can sort of buy a certificate of green shipping. And so the way that that's priced, the underlying price that companies are paying for that is it, it exceeds $100 per ton of CO2. So that adds up into the economics of the user of the hydrogen because they may also be avoiding carbon tax and so forth. And, and why are companies willing to pay this green premium? My at least sort of digging into it, I think it's primarily driven by companies and corporations setting net zero goals with the science-based targets. And because for a lot of companies, uh, they need to start focusing on scope three emissions if they do it sort of if they do the science based targets. If a certain proportion of their emissions are scope three, they need to address them right away. And if they're shipping their products, for example, they just need to reduce those emissions and are willing to pay for that. And that's just one of many examples. You also see some in, in steel and others. The big question is how will that develop? What proportion of people are willing to pay that or companies and, and so forth? Okay, great. Well, given that, Jacob, what's the practical way to kind of factor in this premium? We understand that there's no answer. There's no market at the moment. But as we make the decisions on this, think about the, uh, the premium. Are there some practical tips that you can share? Yeah, and I think it's like you're, you're right on. And it showed in the poll. There's just so much uncertainty. And that's why folks see that as a, a big challenge with investing in hydrogen. But if you wanted to... Yeah, like a practical way to understand what a green premium might be. Yeah. Not all the data is publicly available. You could look at, uh, like Anar mentioned, uh, companies that are willing to pay that green premium right now, like long-term uh, marine shipping, to, to give you a sense. But maybe something that's more publicly available is you could look at uh, the Europe uh, carbon price or carbon border adjustment mechanism and see uh, uh, what that cost is and use that as a sort of like rough indicator of what a premium you might get, at least for any of your product that, that you would ship into um, into Europe. Okay, so we can use that kind of as an implied premium, if you will, um, to factor into, factor into account. Um, Einar, a question to you, how do you make an investment decision on um, on green hydrogen when the forecast show the electrolyzers uh, cost will drastically decline in price over time. Basically, the cost will decline so much in the, the, the over time. How do you decide on that uh, right now? So I think as, as we mentioned, sort of it can both drive your decision on if you invest in green or something else and, and also what technologies you believe in. Uh, and it is, but at least in my view, it doesn't push you away from doing it today. Uh, because you can want to wait until it's cheaper. Fact is that sort of for a regular plant lifetime, you'll need to replace your stacks in the electrolyzer several times over the next 20, 30 years. So just reflecting the expectations about the cost decline in your economics is, is critical. Um, and as we showed, there's plenty of resources with forecasts on that. And you may have your own right. opinions. Right, the relative cost reduction in pace could uh, switch the preference between the two, but there actually mm -hmm. uh, there are other bigger factors such as cost of renewables and a natural gas price. I'll just take one last question. This one for uh, for Jacob. So, which makes more economic sense in the medium term, blue or green hydrogen production in the U.S.? <laughs> oh man, that's a that's a tough one. So I, I think it's it's really going to come down to even within the U.S. like which location you're in, right? So. If I was in the Gulf Coast, I would probably lean towards uh, blue hydrogen and getting that cheap natural gas. If you're somewhere else in the U.S. that doesn't have access uh, to as much natural gas, maybe somewhere like California, uh, then I might be thinking more about uh, green green hydrogen. And they may be closer to the uh, to the off takers um, as well. All right, I think that's all we have time for today. Uh, thank you, Jacob and Anar for joining us today. Thank you all for joining us um, online. I want to turn it over to Trudy to wrap up.
Thank you, Sangwan, and thank you to all of today's presenters. As a reminder to 